your, your top there. Why don't you go first? Surely. So my name's Steve Isaacs. I teach game design and development uh, at William Adam Middle School and Ridge High School in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Um, I've been teaching for, I don't know, some ridiculous amount of years, like 27 or 28 years. And um, all middle school until this year, uh, because for quite some time, I've been wanting to get my game design program up to our high school as well. So this year we finally started offering it, um, which is fantastic because it allows kids, um, whether they've taken it in middle school, it gives them a continuation if they're looking for that, or it provides the experience and opportunity for kids in high school that might not have taken it in middle school. Um, I, I love sea turtles. <laughs> um, we've, we've made a wonderful habit of, uh, of going to Hawaii um, for many summers over the past uh, you know, 15 years or whatnot. And my favorite thing in the world to do is to snorkel. And when I can find myself stumbling upon a real live, you know, sea turtle, especially when it's not like where there are a million sea turtles, but just me and a turtle swimming around, it's uh, probably one of my greatest joys in life. Um, it's funny, when we were setting this up, uh, Simon put on his screen that he had taught in China. And uh, it just so happens that I have also taught in China. Um, we both happened to have uh, come across and worked for the same organization uh, teaching like camps in China uh, to kids in a STEM academy, uh, which was an amazing experience for me. I spent two weeks there and really enjoyed the culture and being part of that. Um, and I don't know if you remember the days when we used to like be able to go out and go to places and spend time with other people like in, in large spaces and such. Well, in those days, I was uh, the lead producer for something called Mind Fair, which is um, the uh, the uh, official North America Minecraft fan convention. So there we had, I mean, just all sorts of really neat. We celebrated Minecraft essentially with the Minecraft community. Um, a lot of YouTubers there. We had a learning lab where we did a lot of sessions. In fact, Simon has presented at, at a couple of them. Um, and uh, it's just been you know an amazing experience. I uh, yearn for the day when we can all go back and convene in similar ways and celebrate things we love together, uh, including conferences and that sort of thing. Um, and there's uh, my contact information. Uh, I am very active on Twitter. Um, I really love working with and engaging in that community and being part of the Minecraft education community and the Minecraft community at large has been really wonderful. And the people that I've met and become, you know, close with through that um, has really, you know, both nourished me as an educator and also um, helped me, you know, develop lifelong friendships and things. So feel free to reach out to me. I love to engage with people uh, and, you know, develop those friendships. There you go, okay. Simon. Steve, I'm looking at these photographs of us and then looking at the cameras and our hair. I think we've got the, <laughs> the quarantine hair length is going on here, right? <laughs> yeah, all of it. Uh, well, good morning. My name is Simon Vasey. I'm an instructional technology coach in Lincolnshire Prairie View School District, and that's a suburb of Chicago. And it's a small district. I work primarily with the early childhood through second grade students and teachers. So really, my job is to help the teachers integrate technology into the classroom. Uh, I, I can team teach with them, model lessons, but I also get to work with the students as well. So it's a dream job for me. I get to use all the fun technology tools and work with the students and teachers. And as you can imagine right now with, with schools closed and students and teachers working from home, my job has been particularly interesting and fun and challenging and all those things. So um, I'm a Minecraft Global Mentor. I have been for a few years now, and that's been a wonderful experience. And I would reiterate what Steve just said about the the, the close community that has grown around Minecraft on Twitter and in other places. And I've met so many amazing people and it's opened up so many opportunities. As Steve said, I've, I've been able to present a couple of times at the Mind Fair, um, thanks to Steve inviting me to join in that. And also it opened up that opportunity to uh, go spend four weeks in China this uh, last summer and work at the, at the STEM Academy there using Minecraft to teach STEM concepts with students from all different walks of life in China. That was uh, an unbelievable experience. Um, I'm also an avid board gamer, which is an amazing hobby for me. I have, if you, my background was turned off, you'd see about 150 board games on the shelf behind me. And uh, 
it's really hard to keep up with that when we're stuck at home and we have to do social distancing. But luckily, I found some great online places to play board games with my friends. So COVID-19, you can't stop me playing board games. <laughs> <you know>? Me neither. <laughs> um, uh, there's my contact information. I'm also fairly active on Twitter, uh, Vazy103. Uh, I put my YouTube channel in there. It's really not my YouTube channel. We're, when my students want to record things and share it with the world, I drop it onto there. And um, uh, we've got some links you can you can take a look at later with the with the YouTube in there. Uh, there's my email and LinkedIn. Okay, let's go to the next slide, shall we? We shall. Here we go. Okay, so go ahead, Steve. Ah, well, just basically what we'd like to cover um, for everybody. And, and one thing I do want to actually throw out there before we even really start is please feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, my preference when I'm presenting is to, you know, be very open to being interrupted and to um, sort of gauge the, the presentation by the questions that come in and, and provide that casual discussion oriented, you know, opportunity. So please, please, please um, don't hesitate. Um, Primarily, we're going to talk about, you know, the the the, the question: What is Minecraft, um, and why Minecraft in education? And then we're going to do some uh, demoing of Minecraft in action. And like I had said before, hopefully many of you will play along, um, or you know, you're welcome, of course, just to sit back and watch. But uh, but but feel free to play along once we get to that part. Okay. Uh, so we're we're going to kick things off and maybe get to know you a little. We have a question to ask of you and you can drop your reply into the chat section. We were wondering what has been your go to guilty pleasure during your stay home time? What have you been doing to occupy yourselves or to pass the time? Go ahead and think about that for a moment and drop that into the chat and um, we'll take a look and see what you've all been doing. I'm kind of getting bored of some of my guilty stay home pleasures, so I'd like to learn a few different things I can be doing with my time. Lisa says eating in all caps. <laughs> I've definitely been doing that. Now, I this is interesting. I'm not sure that I'm in the right chat because I'm seeing messages pop up, but I'm not seeing them in the chat. How do I, let's see if I can figure that out. Uh-oh. Here we go, now I'm here. Okay, got it. it. That was interesting. Yeah, Anna's, yeah. Been, Anna's been doing family history research. That's amazing. I, I'm pretty addicted to doing that um, with Ancestry.com and 23 and me. Aaron has been working in the yard. Yeah, me too. We've uh, I had some road bush, rose bushes that died over the winter and we had to I had fun digging those up last weekend. It took a lot of effort. Yes. Uh, but, uh, Lisa been, eating. Oh. I, I feel like eating I, I, I have this I, I'm sort of treating it like we're allowed to eat whatever we want during this time. I don't know if that's the best way to go about it, but it's uh, it's working for me. Oh, is my audio choppy for other people? Uh, I'm hearing you okay, Steve. Okay. Yeah. Amanda has been watching a lot of Twitch. I know, Steve, you're big on Twitch, right? I am. I've been um, streaming uh, twice a day, every day, um, you know, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern and, and 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, and that's been a really great experience because the goal there for me has been to continue offering learning opportunities for my students, but for the greater education community as well, which has been been pretty awesome. Um, Smith, was it Smith there, uh, painting and binge listening to mindless movies and TV series. Yeah, I think my Netflix has been definitely getting uh, a lot of attention lately. Uh, Jennifer's been working from the back porch. I've I've seen a lot of my my colleagues, my the, the teachers I work with. Whenever we're having our, our meetings, they're always outside on the back porch with a coffee. Looks good. Baking. Have you been doing any baking, Steve? My wife is, uh, she actually is a trained pastry chef. So she has been baking a lot, um, which is part of that, goes back to that eating whatever I want thing. Uh, <laughs> she made an absolutely amazing focaccia a couple of times that we've been, uh, that I've eaten much more of than you're supposed to. Um, as well as other great stuff. We had a great apple tart the other night. Um, and then, you know, so that part's been nice, you know, having actually time, I think, for my wife. She's that's She does that as a hobby, which we benefit from. Uh, but also, um, 
the, you know, the whole having more time as a family has been really wonderful. Yeah, I, I would agree, especially being a board gaming house. You know, we, we're definitely getting some board gaming sessions in now we're stuck at home together. Yeah. Uh, Dave has been to, been to uh, simulations and lots of TV. I see uh, Solitaire playing there, Netflix, Coke Zero. <laughs> <laughs> Having longer jogs in the morning. Yeah, I've actually That's been great. much more active than I usually am. So it's been probably good for my health in many ways. Yeah. Uh, Zachary, Minecrafting? Yes. You're in the right place. Yeah, you're in the right <laughs> place. Um, I don't know, Michelle was in a musical that had to switch to online. Oh, my gosh. That's so cool. Green screen. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. What a That's challenge. Right. Uh, some more yard work there, learning more about ed tech robots. Hey, right on my desk here, I'll give a little plug for these guys. I've got my Wonder Workshop robots right here. Dash. Minecraft coding. Okay. Do you see any others in there, Steve, that we should share out there? Um, it's funny. I just went back to the other. I, my screens are weird, but um, I okay. think we can move on. But but keep yeah. them coming. Okay. It's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, it's nice to meet you all. I think we're all yeah. kind of in the same boat. Yeah, I think we're living parallel lives. Um, okay, so yeah, as Steve mentioned, use the meeting chat to communicate with us. Um, we'll be watching that closely. So if you have questions or thoughts you want to drop in there, go ahead and do that. Um, but otherwise, let's try to stay connected after today, right, Steve? Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, so let's get, let's kind of start diving into some of the, the Minecraft content here. Sure. So, but you know, so what is Minecraft really? Um, Minecraft is a game of uh, digital blocks, essentially. Some people refer to it as sort of like a uh, a virtual Lego um, type thing. But the game itself, which is really interesting, has two, well, really more than two, but two distinct game modes that you could play in. So there's something called creative mode and something called survival mode. So in creative mode, um, and actually, if you could advance, I think I'd talk about yeah. them with some, some text. Um, creative mode has, uh, and just you could click through because I think the things are going to come up. But uh, basically, creative mode has um, you know unlimited resources. You can use all of the blocks essentially available in the game. And the goal essentially is just to build, build, build. And we call this a sandbox environment. And um, you know the no worries is kind of like you're you know, you're, you're safe for the most part in creative world, um, where in survival world, not always the case. Um, so in survival mode, it's a little more of a, you know, that's where it's more like a game than a sandbox environment. Um, you have limited resources. Um, it's interesting when you talk to different people about which they prefer. I really enjoy survival mode because I like the idea of mining for resources, gathering resources, collecting the resources you're going to use to do things, crafting items, which is a big part of the game, hence the name. Um, the goal is to stay alive uh, and, you know, mobs come out at night unless you keep it on what's called peaceful mode. But basically, um, what I find a lot of times in the educational environment is that you'll, at least in my experiences, you'll have kids probably more likely working in creative mode to create the experience, but then they might change it to either what's called survival mode, which I talked about, or something that we use in my class a lot called adventure mode, where the kids can still um, be impacted by things in the world, but also because it's this adventure mode, they can't break blocks and things. So I teach game design. So my kids are creating games. So more often than not, once somebody else is going to play their game, they're supposed to play it the way the designer intended it. The same would probably apply a lot of times to um, builds that your students do. Like, let's say they build a recreation of, um, you know, the Eiffel Tower. If they're in adventure mode, they can experience it, but can't add to it or break it, which is often what you would want in that case. So I hope that gives a little context. We're going to get, you know, of course, much deeper into to what this, you know, it all is all about. Um, so, and we want to talk just, you know, a little bit, of course, about what's happening in schools. And here's a, a picture of, um, you know, and, and this is interesting because as long as I've known Minecraft to be around, people have 
created projects of building their school in Minecraft. But if you've been watching the news with COVID, um, it's that has gone, you know, you know, way beyond. In fact, um, you've probably seen some articles where kids are creating their whole graduation experience in, in the game. But Simon shared an article and it's in the wakelet that maybe you'll talk a little bit about what um, MIT. Oh yeah, so um, I just discovered this this morning. I was reading about it. The, the amazing students at MIT with a lot of time on their hands now decided to get together and start a server and recreate the entire campus of MIT. And many, many students were joining into this wall together and some of them were working on building their beloved dorms you get their classrooms, the quad spaces. Um, and now that it's mostly done, there are a few places they're still working on that had some really challenging architecture with strange angles and they're kind of reworking those and collaborating. Uh, but now they're kind of mostly done. They're sharing that world out with other other schools and they're gonna play games on their campus like capture the flag right. and kind of just do some socializing and have fun there uh, and kind of just still feel that connection to their campus and to each other and other students who are going through um, what they would like to do. Uh, Steve, do you need control of the screen there? Um, no, 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 not yet. Oh, okay. But, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. I just saw our message pop up there. Okay. Oh, I don't, uh, yeah. Still, it's funny. I'm struggling in the weirdest way with just trying to be able to see the full on chat plus what we're doing. But I, I trust that Jennifer will, um, Jen will uh, just feel free to interrupt if there are questions and things that we can address during, and I'll stop worrying about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So uh, also with what you said about MIT, what I think is so cool is there's so much potential for engineering and automation and things in Minecraft. I mean, people have built like ridiculous, fully functioning computers and calculators and clocks and things in the game. I can only imagine what these kids at MIT are, are doing. In fact, actually, what I just saw, um, my wife shared a link the, yesterday about somebody who created, recreated the micro bit. So there's a big micro bit in Minecraft that they created. And then they have, if you've used a micro bit before, it's a small physical computing device and they've set it up so that what they're doing on the physical micro bit works with the one on the screen. And uh, what I found interesting about this too, is that the, when I was reading a little bit about the article uh, or, or actually the tweets. So the person who did it tweeted something and then said, um, and then somebody asked them something else. And the person's response was, well, I'm actually fairly new at Minecraft, which I think is just amazing to think that this person who barely has been using Minecraft somehow did something I couldn't even imagine where to start, to be quite honest with you. So crazy stuff. Um, but in, in terms of the, the why, which is I think the most important reason why we're here, for one, Minecraft more than anything I've ever seen in my career, um, leverages student-driven learning. Um, so, and it also leverages something we call student expertise. So a lot of times the question comes up like, oh, my kids playing Minecraft all the time at home. Why do I want them to play it at school? My response to that is always, that's exactly why we want them to play it in school or to use it as a tool in school, I should say. Um, when we give kids a meaningful activity that has them creating it in Minecraft, they're, they're still doing everything you want in terms of the learning outcomes, but they're working in an environment that they're so excited and comfortable with. And not only that, it's like, it's like imagine if you had all these ed tech tools that you didn't have to necessarily teach the kids how to use. Like if they came in already knowing how to use them, and now they could use them effectively for what you want in class. To me, that's a pretty magical thing. Um, but also allowing them to have you know, a lot of choice and autonomy in learning. Um, you also get, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it as well, Simon, the kids that might not have been excelling in certain areas and all of a sudden now they're empowered to use Minecraft and they become like a star in their class because they have this skill, you know, I mean, talk about giving kids a, a boost um, in self-esteem sometimes, which is really wonderful. Um, the, the, we talked about it already and I guess we'll keep talking about it is just the community of educators. Um, I think that educators that are involved in game-based learning and using Minecraft are among, in my experience, is the most passionate sharing group of educators I've ever met. Um, I think it's because they love it so much that they just want to share and, and collaborate and things like that. Um, so that, I mean, that's been, for me, has been a great 
sense of support and a resource. And when I started using Minecraft and I started reaching out to people, um, it was great to have people on the other side that were so quick to to help out. Um, you know, the the engaging students in their world, that kind of goes a little back to that part. I was talking about student expertise. Uh, students and teachers as content creators. My biggest feeling, you know, is that we want kids creating content, you know, not just consuming content, especially with technology. Um, students are amazing with what they can build and create in Minecraft. Teachers, it's interesting. Some teachers get super into it. Like I've been working a lot with Eric Leitner lately, and some of the things he's been building because he's interested and passionate, you know, that he's going to use with his group of educators and and such is remarkable. Also, um, in the past, when Minecraft first kind of came out, there were these teachers that I think had this absolute labor of love going into what they were creating. Like there's um, a project called uh, a Humanities Project called the World of Humanities that takes kids through this whole role playing game, learning about history and mythology that was mostly created by the teacher. Nowadays, I think we've shifted much more towards the idea that with Minecraft, the students are often the creators, plus it kind of takes some of the pressure off teachers thinking they're supposed to build something for their students rather than saying to their students, you know, here, you know, that, that's your <laughs> that's your task. Um, digital citizenship. Um, again, like I'm all about teaching things in context and with Minecraft, when you any 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 collaborative or group experience in Minecraft ends up becoming a lesson in digital citizenship, whether you mean for it or not. Some people do it very intentionally and almost um, put the kids in a situation where conflict will arise so they can address it. Others start out with a code of conduct that the kids come up with and then play through, you know, and then others, as things naturally happen, address them, which I think is, is really pretty great. Um, and then, you know, uh, problem solving. I've never seen kids <laughs> attack problems like I have in Minecraft. The one of the neat things is um, there was never an inst uh, an instruction manual per se for Minecraft. All of the information on how to do things is user generated. So there's this incredible constructivist learning community out there that happened organically. Um, so our kids learn from that and then sometimes even contribute back to that. But kids that are using Minecraft, see somebody else do something and get this thing like, oh, I want to do that. How am I going to do it? And they learn in a very, you know, real way, kind of like they would at home if they're motivated to learn something. And here we can have them motivated on that level in school. Um, and in terms of like cross curricular, every content area. And that's one of um, the things Simon will talk a lot about is how he's used it with his students in his curriculum areas, which is very different from, from mine. And I think I've come to a point where I haven't, I can't even think of any content area that I have not seen represented in some way in a lesson in Minecraft. Steve, you did a beautiful job describing all that. And as you were talking about it, just about every one of these bullet points um, was occurring just a few days ago with my second graders when they were working on their dream house uh, building mm. challenge two teams of students, which I'll show you some pictures in a minute, but all of these things were happening and this little microcosm of just a, you know, an hour and a half building challenge where they were kind of socializing. <laughs> so it, everything so you said awesome. is absolutely perfect. Yeah. Um, all right, so should we go on to the next slide? It looks like we've got um, some, we can probably go through these quickly. There's uh, some other sure. examples. You're, it, there it goes. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, pixel art is one of the, the kind of, um, sort of easy wins, I'd say a lot of times in Minecraft, because we can have kids d work with visual spatial skills, art skills, and recreate or create, you know, art in the game. And then um, coding. The change, yeah. Uh, yeah, with, uh, so for those of you who are not aware, Minecraft Education Edition, one of the things I was so excited when they launched was something called Code Builder, where you can code in um, both uh, in block-based or text-based code. 
you can code, um, you know, anything you want to have happen in Minecraft. And it's, again, it's like this thing where we're teaching coding, but in a context that's so relevant to kids. So where they kind of understand Minecraft and what they want to do in Minecraft, and now they're attaching coding opportunities to that. It's pretty wild. We'll show a little demo of Code Builder um, during our session as well. Okay. It takes a little while for the next slide to appear. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I wanted to just spend a, a brief amount of time just sharing some of the things I've I've worked on with my students in Minecraft. Um, in second grade, we've we've really done a lot to do with social studies. Actually, um, a lot of our social studies curriculum, when I was kind of looking at what the teachers were currently doing, it was it was pretty you know it was pretty not very inspiring. It was a lot of worksheets and and things from books and over pretty quickly. So I, we took a look at one of our units where the students learn about goods and services and the concept of taking raw materials, processing them, putting them together in a product and then selling that as you know as a product. Um, and that was absolutely perfect to, to kind of take a look at through Minecraft. As Steve mentioned earlier, when, when the students are working in that survival mode, um, if you want to have, if you want to collect wood, you have to chop down a tree and then and kind of harvest the wood. Um, so that concept of taking a raw material, processing it, and then turning it into a product was absolutely perfect to do in Minecraft. So we took one of the starter worlds that uh, uh, Microsoft had created, and we added some additional structures to it. And we created this kind of uh, simulation world where the students could go through that process together. Um, so you can see in the pictures there, there was a, a working farm, there were factories, there was a mall they could set up their stores in to sell their products. Um, We've also done, we've dabbled a little in science. One of our uh, science units in second grade is learning about biomes and uh, the needs of the needs and wants of animals. And so this some in this class here, the students uh, were responsible for setting up some different biomes and creating the biome so that would perfectly meet the needs of the animals that would live in that biome. Uh, and I'm not sure if Steve, if you mentioned one of the one of the amazing things about Minecraft is it has all these different biomes. If you go walking through the world, you can you wander through jungles and ocean uh, oceans and deserts. And, and there are also some fantastical biomes that you would never find on planet Earth, but some of them are quite similar to, to real world experience. So they're able to add uh, different kinds of animals, like in the tundra, they were able to put uh, some polar bears in there. Uh, and, then, and in the ocean environment, there are, oh my gosh, what are there, salmon and dolphins, all these amazing animals you can, can uh, kind of put together there. Uh, we've also done some coding. The students uh, have a wonderful time uh, using Code Builder. And in second grade, they're really just kind of getting into that concept of what coding is and that the block language is absolutely perfect for them to, to play around with. And, and we'll take a look at Code Builder. Uh, it looks a little daunting at first, uh, but once you start to play around in there, you realize it's actually a whole bunch of fun and, and another big sandbox all to itself. And then finally, I have a few pictures here of, of uh, the students I worked mm. with in China. Ah. Uh, yep. You probably recognize that classroom, Steve. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, my my job in China there was to try and connect some real world science into Minecraft, which uh, was definitely a fun challenge, and but also always based around the engineering cycle of planning, creating, testing, and improving. Um, but starting with a question and imagining how you could answer that question. So you can see there the students um, were building their gravity roller coasters. They were dropping the marbles around and trying to get it to go through one loop, two loops, three loops, and then we ended up building gravity powered roller coasters in Minecraft. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that, we switched over to creating code that could generate uh, roller coasters for us. Uh, and you can imagine the kids were very excited every day to come into this classroom. Yes, it's awesome. <laughs> and then uh, finally, I'll just share when the slide comes up. Here we go. Um, this is just very recently, I was, I was uh, alluding to that um, the classroom I've been working with to give them some kind of socializing time within Minecraft. Um, I figured out how to get the kids connected into my laptop here at home. And you can see in the center picture there, all of the, the students I was working with at school are now connected virtually inside of Minecraft. And the teacher and I worked together to set up a, a simple challenge. We split the class in half and said, build a dream house where when all of this is done, you get together and have a big hangout class party, what would you want inside of these houses? And you can imagine all the amazing things they came up with. And we can take a look maybe at that world later. Uh, you can see there, there's always parkour in Minecraft, right, Steve? I think kids love doing yep. parkour. You have to jump around the blocks, hot tubs. And then you'll see later, one of the classes decided to build a roller coaster inside of their house. 
And the other team looking over said, oh, how did you do that? What is that? And they saw fireworks in the other team. And so we, we mm -hmm. had some time where the, the groups could switch over, go and explore. And then they wanted to learn how to do the things that they had seen in the other houses. So like I think you mentioned earlier, Steve, there's always a lot of like, how do you do that? I want to learn yeah. how to do this. So, yeah. Um, what a great motivation and they've had to learn. Yeah, they've had an absolute blast working together and socializing and hearing each other and working. It's definitely challenging working together in Minecraft when you're not in the same room, but we've kind of overcome those challenges and it's it's been an absolute blast. It's great. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I, I dropped it in the chat, I think, but, uh, you know, I want to also share because it's so similar to what Simon was just talking about. We have um, uh, put out, uh, Eric Leitner, my wife Kathy, and I uh, have been working with NASEF, the North American Scholastic Esports Federation, and we put together a series of challenges. Um, we have six different challenges that are build challenges that are open to everybody, and it's on Flipgrid. So the kids are creating their worlds based on these different themes and then sharing them through video on Flipgrid. It's uh, flipgrid.com slash Minecraft COVID-19. And all the challenges relate to COVID. So one is a build your dream house, but your dream quarantine house. Um, one is um, actually build a model of the, uh, and you can see these if you go to the site too, a model of the coronavirus. Uh, one is um, this one that you see on this screen here, and I'll show you the world a little bit later, which is either a museum or library. Um, it's basically called Inform the Public, and you're trying to, to, you know, use research skills to learn about and teach um, about the COVID virus. So we have kids learning and then teaching and sharing their worlds about that. Um, we have one that's an escape room theme, so that's a little more automated. One that's a Rube Goldberg machine, so all sorts of neat stuff. Um, and we actually have one coming out if you're if you have hockey fans in your group um, with the NHL and the Anaheim Ducks called the Minecraft Face Off, and that's another one. And the idea here is that we're trying to engage kids and create activities for them during this um, stay at home period. So we're going to now go into the game. Um, so let's see if my screen sharing cooperates. And I am now in Minecraft Education Edition, and hopefully, um, not only will you see it, but it won't be too choppy. So right now, I'm going to just show you real quick this project, just because this is the world that I opened up. But this is one of my students um, created the Museum of COVID-19. And, and I'll talk a little more about this, and I'm going to show you how to play the game in a moment. But if you're in the meantime, if you're launching Minecraft yourself, you'll be able to join us when we get to that part. But um, inside this, whoops, inside this world, this is uh, um, this student created a museum, has these things called NPCs, which we'll talk about because they're specific to Minecraft Education Edition. And when I right click on one of them, we can, he will, there is dialogue. So, and as I do this, I'll kind of talk about it in the context of Minecraft and Education and Education Edition. So, NPCs, as well as some of these signs you're going to see in a second, are specific to Education Edition, and they were brought in by the education team specifically because one of the things teachers especially wanted was more opportunities for students to explore narrative and sort of if they're doing, creating these worlds where they're teaching something or, or demonstrating their learning, they can do it with narrative, as you can see. So this is... Um, Jerry introducing people to the uh, museum. And if you're familiar with a lot of the Microsoft products, here we have it in Immersive Reader as well. So it will load up Immersive Reader and read this to you. I don't know if you see that. Do you see it, the Immersive Reader part? You do, okay. Yes. Because I think yeah. the way I'm sharing my screen, I'm not sure if you'll see everything, but it will. Yeah, we're, we're just not able to hear it, but. Uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, right off the bat, how cool is it that they, and this is one of those things about, you know, my, <laughs> Minecraft Education Edition is they're continually updating with great things. So the fact that Immersive Reader is built in right now is pretty awesome. So as I walk around the museum, you know, there's different things. And, um, and <laughs> the other thing the player, the student did was he has these NPCs that also have resources these won't show up correctly the way I'm showing it, but what would happen is if I click on each of these, 
it actually brings up a website that the student wants to point you to. In their case, some of it's their resources, some are pictures that go with this. So again, we're now using these NPCs, and don't worry about the how yet, but using NPCs in Minecraft to actually link back out to real resources online, okay? Um, and so forth and so on. You know, the idea, um, and there's a video in, in the Wakelet thing that we did. Um, there's a video of a live stream we did with this student where he walks you through the entire museum. Great kid, a seventh grader, and it goes on and on. So um, for now, I'm not going to worry so much about this, but just understand that this is the kind of thing you could imagine kids doing. And they're up top, even uh, created at the top of the museum, a model of the virus. So yeah, I'm a little proud of this uh, student. So anyway, I'm going to go over here for now, and then I'm going to drop down. Ooh, here's a lot of people over there. And we're just going to talk a little bit about, about how to work in, in Minecraft. So right now, I'm in, um, I'm in a creative world in education edition, OK? So if and I guess just by a little show of um, are people playing along? I'm going to assume some of you are. Um, it, regardless, I'll, I'll be kind of demoing what you do. So now I'm holding my mouse right now and your mouse, if you're using a computer, the mouse serves as like your eyes. So I'm looking up, I'm looking down, I'm looking left, I'm looking right. OK, and it's when you have kids like for Simon, this uh, Simon, are your kids using the computer mostly or an iPad? We um we are we have iPads at our school. Um, uh -huh. before we before it was available for iPad, we were using laptops with the you know the mouse just like you're doing, Steve. And it was definitely yeah. a challenge because this the, the generation right now our, our yes. touch screen generation. Um, and once we got things onto the iPad, it, we, the kids had a much easier time in the younger grades. That's so interesting because what I found with even what we do at Mindfair, we have this learning lab, and when we started about six five years ago, kids more people were playing on the computer. So I wasn't having to teach kids how to use the computer as much. All of a sudden, as you mentioned, all these kids that were born with an iPhone or an iPad in their hand are so comfortable with that. Funny thing is, if I were to go back and play with the iPad, I would need one of them to teach me. But um, but luckily, I'm a computer guy. So when I have to teach the kids how to use the computer, we go through this. But even my seventh and eighth graders, I end up going through a little bit of this for the ones who are still most used to using either an Xbox controller or or the um, iPad or what have you. So anyway. Hey, Steve so and Simon, on. we've got yes, quite yes. a few people who are brand new to Minecraft. They don't even know how to get the game or where to go to access I was, it. So do you want to take a step back and maybe help at least guide people yeah. where to know so they can go get the game was, when they are ready to yeah, play? Yeah, I was just going to grab I was just going to grab the link and drop it into the chat, actually. Yeah. Um, do you want us to show it or shall I just put the link? Uh, yeah, think? like we've got people who've literally never used Minecraft before, so it might be nice to start right at the beginning of launching Minecraft, where to go to get started, that kind of stuff. Sure. Okay, so uh, I'll put the link to, so the Minecraft Education Edition website has a download page, um, and if you'd like, I guess the first step is getting the software. Um, so you're so going to- Why don't I let you share, do you want to share your screen, Simon, to show them through this yeah. process? All right, let me bring that over here. Let's click that. Okay, are you seeing the my website here? Okay, yeah, so this are. is the Minecraft Edu yeah, Minecraft Education Edition website. Uh, it's definitely a go-to location for you. And under uh, support, there's a downloads page. And right here is everything you're going to need. So for, as far as platforms, um, I have a Mac, so it's kind of showing me recommended here for my Mac. You can also download this for Windows. And if you have an iPad, you can download it for the iPad as well. I think somebody said uh, asked about Chromebooks in the chat. It's not currently available for Chromebook. Um, so you choose your platform, click download, and then you would install the software. It, it, it doesn't take too long to do that from my experience. Um, so then maybe, Steve, do you want to jump back into the like the start screen for Minecraft? Sure. Um, no. Let's see here. So let me just make sure I'm sharing it again. Oops. So uh, I'll put the link in the chat. Is the link in the chat as well? I'd like a direct link. 
Uh, where's the chat? In fact, what I'll do then too is I'll also show starting a new world anyway. So, all right. So let's go to here, save and exit. Um, thanks. So, thanks for posting the link there. Perfect. Let's see now. I'm going to even go out a step further. So when you do launch Minecraft Education Edition initially, you're gonna should come up with this. Now, um, what they did recently is they offered a demo lesson that you didn't even need to log in to try. So it made it very easy access for teachers to just launch this and have their kids do the demo coding lesson, which is good for hour of code. Um, so also, Minecraft Education Edition, uh, maybe Simon had said it, is free to all all educational institutions through the end of this year because of the situation we're in. Um, and there are a number of resources. I even put a number of them in the wakelet. So I put the getting started. I put the remote learning guide in the wakelet. So there are a lot of ways for you to get that information. Um, you do need an Office 365 account, which are also free. Um, you know, sometimes it does mean, though, getting your IT department involved in creating that and creating it for the students. But once you have that sorted out and you launch Minecraft Education Edition after installing it, I go to sign in and it is available also on the iPad at the App Store um, Minecraft Education Edition. So when I go to sign in, um, I'm going to sign in with my school domain. OK, so all of my students once they have their Office 365 account, it'll be, you know, there. And what we use is their same, this is the same email address they would use if they were logging into Google, you know, Classroom or their email or whatever. So it's this, it's an Office 365 account, but using the same email address. And then when they go in, um, there's so much more we're gonna get into here, let's see. <clears throat> so here's where, then now they're in and I'm here and when I hit play and this I might as well take a step back too and show you this library as well. So the worlds that you have are going to be stored in here and a couple little things just to always keep in mind. Your Minecraft worlds are stored on your computer, not in the cloud, not based on your account. So what often happens and um, when I was when we were in school or even now when kids are working on different devices, I would have a kid work on something at school and if they didn't remember or understand how they were supposed to export it to bring it home, they would get home, log in and have a little bit of a panic attack because they would think their world was gone. Um, so one of the things I get into fairly early with my kids is how they can export their world and all that. I don't want you to worry about that right now, especially in our situation right now. Most people are working on the same device, so we actually are so concerned. Um, but in the library area, we have a number of lessons, OK, under all different topic areas. And when you go to one of these lessons, it'll um, actually we can navigate all the way down to a point that you can create the world. So in other words, this algebra architecture world has a starter world to go into that is set up for the activity. It gives you all the information about it here, even has a link to the lesson plan and such. So that's really nice to know that when you're trying to get started and you just want ideas, you can go right here and they're populating this with um, you know, with some of the best lessons that have been created by the community. OK, so these are all different areas. Well, that's math, all these other content areas. Um, I mean, really amazing, great stuff. OK, so when you do get into it and you start using it for the first time, explore these areas. The monthly build challenges are put out by the education team. So those are really helpful for ideas, especially again, when we're giving kids choice during these times, you know, that they're learning at home, it's kind of nice to sometimes be able to offer them just one of the challenges and say, even to let them choose one and then submit artifacts to you as the teacher that show what they completed. Uh, Simon was talking about biomes. So biomes are the different, uh, different, you know, types of ecosystems and pretty neat for teaching all sorts of different things. 
um, but also for what world kids might want to start in, depending on what they're doing. And then these featured worlds are worlds that they could just launch and and play right from from here. And finally, this how to play section has a number of tutorials. So when you're, you know, kind of getting yourself oriented, the education edition tutorial um, will guide you through everything from how to move around, how to build, how to um, break blocks, all that kind of stuff. And there are a few other ones. And then under here, there's also some coding and chemistry tutorials. Um, if you're a chemistry teacher, you'll be real excited to know that they added a whole chemistry add on that teaches a number of chemistry concepts, but also has uh, blocks and things in the game that are specific to chemistry. OK, I'd be happy to show that later, Steve, if we have time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now in this case, let's just say we want to create a new world. So I'm going to create a new world here and I'm going to say new. And this is the setting screen that we're going to see. OK, I could just hit play and it'll use whatever the settings are here and it'll create a world. But in this case, let's say I want to have it be a creative world. OK, the difficulty peaceful essentially means there won't be any of the, the, the bad monsters and stuff. Easy, they will come out, but they won't be you know, as difficult. And then it goes all the way to normal and hard. So we'll keep it peaceful for now. Um, the world type, flat is just going to be a very flat world. Depending on what um, the activity is, sometimes you might want that to say, OK, everybody start with a flat world, and then you're going to do this in that world. The infinite world has the terrain and everything. Um, there are so many other options, so many you don't have to worry about at first, but it's really neat that as kids get more advanced, the coordinates show you where your player is in the world at all times, which becomes very useful um, for some of the more advanced things you might end up doing. And always day is one some people would like because you know it doesn't go through the day night cycle. So um, especially for people who are new and all of a sudden it goes into night and they're like, it's dark or, or if they're in survival and then the mobs start coming out. Um, so that's an option. Whenever you have the settings that you're happy with, you can basically just hit play. Host means that you're going to have it specifically be a multiplayer world, but you can go back and host it even after you've started it as a single player world. So it's not so important to distinguish between that now. So I'm going to hit play and now it's going to generate a world for me. And the worlds in Minecraft are huge. So as you get into it, you might start to consider things like how are we going to um, ensure that kids stay in certain areas and things. But you know, there's that. So here's a beautiful world. We've got water. We've got seems like some sort of glacier here and such. So right now, and I want to show you again the, the movement and all that because I was just flying around. You're probably like, how's he doing that? So, um, so remember what I said before, where you're moving around with your eyes, right, with the mouse. So if anybody's playing along, just go ahead and please do that. Then to move, and if you are one who plays a lot of games, this will be natural to you. But if you're not, this will be all new. And if you notice on the left of my screen, it gives you a little cheat sheet. But W is forward, S is back, A and D are left and right. Now, left and right, in this case, it's doing something called strafing, which is just, I'm still, it's like I'm walking, you know, taking side steps. Um, but anytime I'm facing any direction based on the way I'm looking, W is forward based on that, okay? And D is backwards based on that, okay? So that's starting to make some sense. And the A, W, A, S, and D part, again, people who play games, think of it like the arrow keys, but, um, but for games that use a mouse and keyboard, that just happens to be the configuration. You can change it in the settings. Um, now, a big part of Minecraft is breaking and building. So I can break blocks by left clicking my mouse button. Now, in creative, they just break immediately. In survival, there's a little bit more of a idea that you're actually breaking the block. Um, if I go to my to the inventory. Hey, Steve. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, if you're able to go a little slower because of the the low frame rate, it's it's a little hard to see right now. Gotcha. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so if I hit E, do you see my inventory? Or not yet? Yeah, you're good now. Yeah, I think okay. it's catching up. Okay. So my inventory is basically, and remember, I'm in creative right now, so I have access to every single block in the game. Okay, there's a lot. And these here are the chemistry ones that Simon's going to show you in a little bit. Um, so basically, just to keep it real simple, let's just say I take some oak planks. So I click them into this part here, which is called my hot bar. Some people call it your tool belt or your belt. So see how down at the bottom of the screen now I have that block there. In order to build, I just right click where I want that block to go. And if I'm looking at it, see how there's a crosshair on my, my computer screen? Oh, and it says too something about poor, bad network quality. So I don't know if, or am I choppy now too and such? You're, you're, as long as you go slow, I think, and you know, give it a chance to. Turn your camera off, okay. Stephen, it will help. All right, let's do that. Let's see now. Uh, da, 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 da. Turn my camera up. So, so while there Steve's doing that, um, because everything is three-dimensional in Minecraft, you're looking at a cube, you see three faces of the cube. So when Steve wants to build an additional cube connected to the ones that are already there, he has to actually kind of put the crosshair over the face of the cube that he wants to connect the new cube to. And um, interestingly, when it comes to uh, gravity, if I've built these and then I knock out the bottom, many blocks will still stay up in the air. <laughs> so that's just how you how you build, okay? So we've got break is left click. And chop down the tree, which again, if I was doing it in survival mode would be a different kind of process. And then right click places the blocks. And I mean, that gives you at least the basic movements and such. Okay, did I hope that made sense in terms of left W, A, S, and D, your eyes, the mouse is used for a number of things, breaking and build and building. Okay. Yeah, so, so for the people watching, when you yeah. actually try this yourself, it, it definitely doesn't feel this laggy. It, the game is very smooth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate would... that, it's, uh, that it is slow frame rate but um yeah. why don't we then switch over um uh uh simon or actually why don't i show real quick and again this is not something you would necessarily use right away but your kids um will be pretty good with this but i just want to show you the existence of code builder and we'll see if it shows up correctly on here but if i hit c it brings up code builder and i'm just going to show you something real basic here and then I think Simon's going to show you some of the chemistry stuff just to show you a different idea of what is possible in Minecraft. So um, are you seeing my code builder as well as my yeah. screen? OK, terrific. Yeah, code builder is pretty so, smooth, yeah. Oh, great. So code builder has this great number of tutorials and also allows you to just create a new project. I'm going to show you one of the tutorials just so you see how intuitive you know, their system is for getting started. Now, when I click on a tutorial, I get the option to to follow the tutorial in block-based code, Python, or JavaScript. Um, it used to be just block-based for the tutorials, and then they added Python and JavaScript, which is really awesome. And not only that, you can toggle between these three environments. So if you're teaching coding and you want to start with blocks, but then transition kids to text-based coding, you can then have them immediately translate their blocks into Python and then continue in a Python environment or JavaScript or, you know, or, you know, work in in blocks and then eventually transition to this. But the the smooth transition is, is something I'm really excited about. So I'm going to go into blocks. There's my agent getting ready to start. And this is, um, <laughs> this is a, a popular favorite uh, tutorial. It's called raining chickens. And I'm going to hit OK here and then um, I'm going to follow this tutorial. It says on chat command, rename it chicken. So for those of you who have any you know, familiarity with coding, this is almost like I'm setting up a function or a subroutine. 
So I'm going to make it that when I type in the word chicken, something is going to happen. OK. And now and the nice thing about the tutorials also is that right now it's not showing me all of the code blocks that I have available. It's limiting them to the ones I need for the tutorial. So now when I go to mobs, and again, there would also be other ones here. I go to spawn, and these are the eggs that you'll see in the game too, but these are all the different animal eggs. So I'm going to stay with chicken, and it tells me um, it, it will run the chicken in the Minecraft chat 000. Um, so this part, the squiggly for each of these means relative to where I'm standing, and that gets into the coordinates I was talking about before. Um, but think of it like your X, your Y, and your Z, and you don't see what I'm doing because I turned my camera off. But the X is like east and west, the Y is up and down, and the Z, let's say, is like the north and south coordinate plane. And I'm going to change this here to 10. Now, what I was saying is this is the X coordinate, which I'm not changing. This is the Y, which is the up and down. So I'm making it so it's going to be 10 blocks above me, and then I'm not changing the Z. So really, this chicken is going to spawn from 10 blocks above me in the sky. So then it tells me to go ahead to Minecraft and press T. And if I type in chicken down here in the chat, whoops, I spelled it right. I can now look up and here comes to see the chicken falling from the sky onto my head. OK, now that's cool. All. But what I always tell kids is like they see that and they're like, wow, that's pretty neat. I'm like, well, what would be cooler than one chicken falling from the sky? And of course, they then, you know, they go usually bigger than 100, but we'll do 100 for now. Um, so loops, which are a common concept in computer science and coding, allow you to repeat something. So if you've used Scratch or anything, I mean, they all have the repeat loop. And here it is right in, in make code. So I'm going to do 100. And now I just coded this to not only spawn one chicken, but repeat that 100 times. So I'm going to go ahead now and, and go in here and type chicken. And Steve, I'm sure your students yeah. are the same, but my second graders at this point say, can we do a thousand? Can we do 10,000? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then they start getting real creative with other things. I, I often then go to this thing where I say, hey, wait a minute. You know, we have a problem in some places where turtles, sea turtles, you've heard admit that I love sea turtles. Sea turtles are, um, you know, are we're, we're afraid they might go extinct. So I go and do this. That's a parrot. Let's see where the sea turtle is. Sea turtle. Yeah. And I decide I'm going to resolve the whole world's turtle extinction problem. And it's still typing chicken because I never changed what the text would say. But now I have 100 sea turtles safely falling into the water to help alleviate that issue. So there you have it. And that's just the scraping the surface like so barely about what you could do. What's neat is with code, in Minecraft, Minecraft has all these commands that are built in that kids know a lot about. <laughs> Any of those commands that they could use in the game, they can then also use in Code Builder with the block-based coding. So I'm going to um, stop my screen sharing now and hand it over to Simon. Does that sound good? Sure. OK. okay. Um at this at this point, do we need to pause for anything or answer any questions? Or I, I know there's been a few questions. Well, maybe while I just yeah, queue up the world here. Yeah. Let's see. All right. Just while I kind of get my screen up and running here. I, I try to answer a few there. Ah, oh, good question. So there was one from Amanda um, about if there's a benefit between using make code or tinker. Um, Tinker is wonderful as well. I, I would say a lot of times it comes down to which environment you're, you know, more comfortable or used to. Um, I've, I love Tinker. I've also grown to really love Make Code. And the thing about Make Code is that Make Code is like Microsoft's coding platform. So, and they use it with a lot of other physical um, computing environments. So, like the micro bit, you can code in Make Code. The Circuit Playground. 
Make Code Arcade came out recently. So, um, so that's why I personally have been leaning a little towards Make Code because I use it in these other different environments. Um, and yeah, and Simon said they're both accessible. You know, they are. They are both wonderful. Uh, yeah, we use Tinker at our school, but I honestly, I, I prefer Make Code. I think. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm gonna turn my camera off too there, just so we can see if this helps. Okay. So uh, we're back at the the start screen of Minecraft. I'm gonna click play, and I'm gonna jump into the the view library page, and we are gonna open up the how to play. And next to start here, there are some additional tutorials, and I'm gonna open up the chemistry tutorial wall for you. This one is. It's been up for a couple of years now, I think, Steve, right? Um, and it's not something I mm, personally yeah. use with, with my second graders, um, but it is a lot of fun. And I really wanted to make sure that you maybe uh, get to see it in action today. And it might encourage you to go play around with this too. It's 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 a world where pretty much you have this like giant chemistry set, right? Where you can um, do all sorts of fun chemistry experiments and explode things and, and create new interesting compounds. Okay, and, and they've built this beautiful world to house the tutorial into. This is one of my favorite worlds that they've created. So I'm just gonna walk forward and follow the path here. And uh, if you're familiar at all with Minecraft, you might see some blocks here that are kind of unique and different. Uh, and there are four crucial blocks in the chemistry world. One is called the element constructor that lets you create elements, um, which we'll start with. And then we can take those elements to a compound creator where we can combine the elements to form new compounds. And then you can combine those compounds together to make something amazing, or if you're not careful, start a fire. You have to be pretty careful in here. And then the final block we can take a look at over here is called the material reducer, which can take blocks that are in Minecraft and reduce them down to their elements. So let's start back over here at the beginning. Hopefully it's not too laggy for you. I'll try to go slow. <laughs> so we're going to open up the element constructor here, and we're going to create some hydrogen and some sodium. So we're going to combine a proton and an electron to make the hydrogen, and then 11 protons, 11 electrons, 11 neutrons to make some hydrogen. So I'm just going to right click onto the element constructor. And here you can see I can add protons, electrons, and neutrons. So there I've added one proton, one electron. And you can see like the, the element diagram here. And here's a block of hydrogen. So I can now pick this up. And the other one I needed to make had 11 of each. So you can see right now this isn't going to generate anything. It doesn't have enough neutrons. And here we go. Here's my sodium. So if I just exit back out of the element constructor here and turn around, this actually gives me the blocks here. And it kind of looks like the the periodic table blocks, right? You see that with the hydrogen and, and the sodium. All right, well, let's take those blocks. I'm going to just walk along here to the next uh, compound creator. So we're actually going to make some sodium acetate, which requires us to put uh, some carbon, hydrogen, sodium, and oxygen together. And right here in the chest uh, are the things I'm going to need. Now, a chest is kind of like a big old storage uh, area, and the, they've loaded up everything I need. I'm just going to take these items out of the chest put them into my hot bar and then slide over to the compound creator and create this sodium acetate. So I'm going to take my two carbon, my hydrogen, my sodium and my oxygen. And over here, I've got a bottle of sodium acetates. Let's grab a few of those. OK, so far so good. Well, why were we making the sodium acetate? Here's why. We're going to open up the lab table and we're going to combine these to actually make something called an ice bomb, which I think, Steve, isn't something you can normally create in Minecraft without kind of doing it with this chemistry route here. So it's asking me to, if I yeah. put four, yeah, four sodium acetate together, I'm going to be able to make an ice bomb. But I do want to show you what happens if you get things wrong in here because it's kind of fun. I'm just going to put two instead of the four I need here and combine it and step back and watch what happens. And I had a little explosion and I started a fire in the chemistry lab. It's gonna, every chemistry teacher's nightmare, right? Let's try and put that fire out. Okay, let's try that again and get it right this time. One, two, three, four, according to the instructions. Now, 
there are many other things you can create. And I know on the website they have kind of a, a, a journal that shows you all the different things you can make in the chemistry world. Let me just pick up this. Here it is. So it's down in my hot bar now. Here's my ice bomb. Well, how about we go outside and test it out? I'm just going to quickly go down here. And in this world, they thoughtfully put some water. I'm going to take my ice bomb and I'm going to throw it at the water. And here we go. We're freezing up the water. Isn't that cool? I could do a little. I feel like Elsa in Frozen here, just you know, freezing everything up. Perfect. OK. And there's one other thing I'll show you here before we leave this world over here. And there are many other areas that teach you about all the different things you can do. You can create balloons down there. Uh, I'm just going to jump over here. This area is where you can make sparklers and glow sticks. This one's pretty cool. I like the glow sticks because it makes me feel like I'm holding a lightsaber from Star Wars. So what they've got arranged up here in these frames, they've helpfully showed us the recipe for making the glow sticks. And when you open these crafting tables here, do you see how it has the nine squares and the three by three arrangement here? What they've tried to do up here is show me if I arrange all of these uh, compounds together here, I should be able to make a glow stick. So I need polyethylene down the sides, polyethylene, polyethylene. I need some hydrogen peroxide at the top and some luminol and then some cactus to make a green lightsaber. Okay, so just one more time, polyethylene, hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so let's go in the chest. There's my polyethylene, my luminol, which was gonna go at the bottom and some hydrogen peroxide. And I think I'm actually gonna make a red lightsaber. Okay, so let's go into the crafting table. So I'm just copying that recipe that you saw up on the wall. The hydrogen peroxide was at the top, I think. And the luminol was at the bottom. Oh, lagging a little bit there. No, don't stop now. Okay. And I put the dye. And here we go. We made a red glow stick. Okay, let's put that down in my hot bar here. And we're going to hold it. But of course, we want it to be nighttime. And they put a handy dandy switch here. I can turn this and instantly turn it to nighttime. And if I press my F5 key, now you can kind of see me in third person. I'm going to hold down and I'm going to shake that glow stick to get it lit up. And here you go. I made my beautiful red glow stick and I feel just like Darth Vader now. I know the kids have a lot of fun <laughs> making the glow sticks. So that's kind of a little glimpse at the chemistry world. It's, uh, I was so excited when they released this and I have a lot of fun in this world. Hopefully you uh, got to see that without too much lag. Okay, Steve, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, oh, I was so, worried. It went very see. silent for a minute. I was worried nobody was listening. <laughs> no, 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 we're here. Everybody was okay. like uh, mind blown <laughs> such in the chat. So good stuff. Oh, cool. Isn't that awesome? I love playing with the chemistry. So between that and the coding, oh my gosh, so much fun. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, what? You know, how are we doing um, for time? We've got about 20 minutes left. I'd love to take a yeah. little pause to see if there are any questions and then a couple other little things I'd love to show in education edition, like the camera and portfolio. Um, so either if you're still in, if you want to show them or I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, I can bring that up. Yeah. OK, but I'd love to see uh, take a moment to see if there are any new questions. Steve, I haven't seen any questions. Most everybody is mind blown. So um, you guys can go ahead and keep going. Sure. And then maybe um, at about 20 after stop and have anybody come off mute that wants to ask questions. And then also be sure to direct them to the uh, Microsoft community to redeem their code for today. Sure. And, and I would just add to that. Hopefully it's a good mind blown in that this isn't too overwhelming. I know some showing these things sometimes. No, it was a good, it was a good mind blown. It was, uh, yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. wow, that's cool. Um, um, I think it's, oh. you know, and that's a good point to reinforce is that we're trying to show you a little bit of what's possible. There's so much, I mean, so much uh, potential here, but 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 nobody has to feel like they're supposed to start in the deep end. Um, you know, we all started very simply by learning how to walk around, place blocks and all that. So the best thing you could ever do is get into the game, play a little, reach out to people for for more support and things um because the the chemistry stuff and the coding stuff probably wouldn't be the first thing that you do no 
So I'm just bringing up here a few of the um, a few of the the kind of unique teacher blocks. Let's do. We got allow. It's pretty useful. Uh, deny. I'll explain these in just a second. Maybe board. Can you think of anything else, Steve? Border. border. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the things I like to show. So you got the the board, the poster. Oh you know, yeah. Those are some of the narrative tools. Um, you know, let's start there. But basically, so yeah, the, right here. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say the camera is such a neat thing that they built in specifically into the education edition because um, for as an assessment tool, a lot of times what you could do is you don't have to necessarily get into the kids' world to check the work they did. You could have them take pictures of certain things and then and Simon will show you how to take the pictures and then how to um, bring you take your portfolio out of the game and then submit that as an artifact. All right, so yeah, I've got the camera tool right now, and I, I see the sheep eagerly trying to get mm -hmm. into this uh, challenge world. So I'm going to actually put the camera down. You can place the camera down in front of you, and it's like one of those old-fashioned uh, cameras that you know, mm -hmm. like from the 1900s. If you right-click on it, it's going to count down and snap a picture, and hopefully that sheep Jeez. is still behind me. Oh, he's kind of photobonging me a bit there. <laughs> time, come on, smile, sheep. There he is. There. Okay, that was a good sheep. <laughs> a good picture. Now the other thing you can do, you can walk around with the camera and just hold it in your hand, and like I can point down at the chicken here and right click. Oh, geez, not right click. What am I doing wrong? It's because I'm pointing at the. Well, ground. no, you're right. Yeah, if you point there. at the block, that's it. it. Place it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I can take a picture of this dream house here, and it kind of does like a one of those old-fashioned. Um, what are they called? The uh, Polaroid. Like, Polaroid, right? Now I want to take a look at those beautiful pictures I just took. The second um, item I have in my hotbar here is the portfolio. So if I open up the portfolio, it started to populate it with those pictures I just took. Here's the dream house, the picture of the chicken, and my selfies. This one's better. I'm going to just trash this first one here. And I can even caption um, here, me and Mr. Sheep. So the students can kind of write little annotations for their pictures. Um, and then when they're done with this, they can actually export the portfolio, and I believe it saves it as a PDF, uh, it which then they can, you know, they can do whatever they need to do with turn it in or build it into a larger project. Um, so that's kind of a way, a beautiful way to capture the creations and the learning that have happened inside. Well, just as Steve said, you don't necessarily have to be in there as the teacher looking at everything and all the time. Um, right. And somebody in the chat also mentioned the the value of the book and quill, which is another great narrative tool. And the book and quill allows you to write text in a book, and you can even add pictures now from your if you've taken. That's right. Yeah, here's the book and quill, so I can. Um, the book and quill is awesome. Yep, you can click edit here and you can add in those pictures that you've already taken within the world. Uh, Steve, we lost your audio there for a second, so sorry if I yeah. started talking no, earlier there. Please, I'm glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and then when we sign the book, it kind of uh, publishes it, right? And we can, we can give it a title and sign and close. And now we can leave this book for other people to read. We can open it and turn the pages. It's like a, a real book. So I've had students in my summer school class. Uh, one of the groups created um, a summer camp and they found an area that was kind of this haunted area and they wrote this haunted scary story to make the spooky area more realistic and fun. So students can get really, really creative with their with their literacy uh, by using the book and code. Thanks for mentioning that one. Um, the other one that Steve mentioned, which is is very useful, this kind of goes along with the NPCs for me, which are the, um, the 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 boards and the posters. These are signs that you can place around the world, and and uh, teachers a lot of times use these to kind of give direction to students, or if it's a student creating a project, it might be showing their learning. Lots of different ways to use these, um, and the students that didn't create the board, right, Steve, they're not able to kind of break and damage these, right? Um, it depends what mode you're in, I think. But uh, if you're a, that's an interesting thing too, depending on the permissions in the world, that would have something to do with, I think, whether you can edit somebody else's as well. Right, so that's a board. There's also a poster, it's a little bit smaller. Um, and you can see, you can kind of place these around the world. 
um, like this one here was just kind of the the overview of what the students were going to do in this challenge, kind of the, the criteria for what they had to do. Um, and then these red border blocks, we actually use these to keep the two teams separate for a while, Steve. Uh, we yeah. Didn't want the, uh, we didn't want yellow team running over all the time to red team's area, potentially accidentally on purpose damaging anything or, right. uh, you know, um, so we kind of kept them separate for a while. And then once they were done, mm -hmm. we opened up a few holes in there and then let them kind mm -hmm. of co-mingle and go and explore each other's houses. Oh, that's great. Um, and you can see yeah. this was the first, yeah, the first roller coaster, and then they all decided they wanted mm. a roller coaster too. <laughs> so awesome, but that's the thing, you're right. So it's like um, there are some, and look at what 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 Simon has in there too, which gets to something else that we would, you know, that is nothing we'll get into quite today. But redstone, which is the like elect electricity in Minecraft that you could you could place redstone and connect it from an input to an output and actually make things happen automatically. And then there are things called command blocks, which I just love because my kids use them to automate things in their games. I mean, just so much amazing potential. And again, the kids often know a lot of this. And if, if, if Minecraft, the one thing Minecraft taught me that completely transformed my approach to teaching and learning was that I could let go of some of that control of thinking that I was the keeper of the knowledge. <laughs> I realized real quickly that I had so much to learn from the kids and my whole approach has become one of like learning with and from my kids rather than feeling like I'm teaching my kids. And it's really exciting to sit down with a kid and be like, okay, yeah, you don't know how to do that. Either do I, but let's, let's approach that problem together and see if we could figure it out. And in that process, the kids, I can model how to learn a little bit too for these kids, so it's awesome. Um, the border blocks, that's a great question. If you have border blocks set up, nothing can go past them even above them, so the flying would not be anything to worry about. So in other words, if I put them even underground, I cannot go past them, um, you know, when they're, when they're in place. Right, I just turned off uh, wall builder mode, which is kind of what the students were in, the mode. And you see, I can't fly past this red border right now. I can't break it. Uh, so it kind of keeps me in place. I feel like it's when we go on field trips, Steve. You know, we always keep our students kind of close by. And in <laughs> some of these worlds, especially second graders, if we don't corral them a little bit, they often wander off and kind of get lost. So right. uh, the border blocks that I find really useful. Sure, and they not, absolutely not are for that. Yeah. And not necessarily to limit what our students can do, but obviously, you know, to kind of, you know, keep it within within the realm of what we want them to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so actually, we also use these allow and deny blocks. So yep. we mm -hmm. wanted to we wanted to keep the students' houses uh, kind of to a set size. So actually, under these houses, and of course, they used every single block they could. Um, but if I just switch back over to to teacher mode here, just kind of underneath, if I dig down a little, let's see. Do you see the brown blocks here? These are these allow blocks. So these there was like a maybe a, a twenty by twenty square that the students were kind of given with their team to uh, to build their houses on. And anything outside of that um, 20 by 20 area, they weren't able to build on initially. So it just kind of helped to contain it a little and then just to give it a, an even an even field for the for the challenge, you know, so both teams kind of had the same size of space to build in. And as you can see, they used every every block they possibly could. <laughs> yeah. And um, so it is it's a little after 120. Um, let's, like Jen said, let's take an opportunity. I'd love for people to come off of mute and even join and ask questions. Um, I do want to remind you that the wakelet that we we um, put out there includes some samples of like Simon's YouTube channel as well as my class YouTube channel. I have a lot of tutorials there that I've created. Um, some of them are from my live streams that we've been doing during COVID where we've taught a Minecraft skill and then posted the recording. I have a lot of student projects um, shared there, so please, um, you know, grab that resource and 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 take some time to, you know, over a big cup of coffee to to look through some of the things that we've shared there. Just some really neat stuff. I I love sharing the great work my students do. Now for questions, please, please, please. So um, Simon and 
Steve, I appreciate you guys doing this because I am brand new to Minecraft and now I'm going down that rabbit hole. So I'm excited <laughs> um, as an instructional coach. I want to know, like, how do you get all of the students in one world? Is there a way like for you uh, to show us that? Because I'm not quite sure how that would work. Yeah. Um, so do you want me to show that, Simon? Or I mean, at least yeah, go in ahead. theory, how you would do it. <laughs> so sure. I'm going to go into my Minecraft world now. So in Minecraft now, if so, if I'm in the world, remember before I mentioned that you could either host a world or you can um, just start playing it and then later invite people into it. If I had escape this little nifty icon with a bunch of people happily being together, that allows them to to play together in theory. If I click start hosting, now what it's going to do is it's going to come up with a code. And this code is something that students on their side would be able to type it or put in like apple, apple, balloon, fish. Now, a couple of things about that. One is um, they've done a whole lot to improve this. It used to be a lot, lot more challenging to join remotely. It still has its challenges sometimes because of firewall issues and stuff. In school, it, it almost always works beautifully and you just yeah. join right in together from home. I've had some wonderful experiences playing with kids and, and having other people be able to join each other. And then sometimes it it, it doesn't work. Um, but anyway, but this is the the way that you would do that. Um, so, you know, so there's that. So the, the join code. So like I said, I've been playing a lot with my nephews. Oh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that you have to be in the same domain because of privacy issues and things with Education Edition. So if Simon students, as much as I would love to have a project where I had my kids work with Simon's students in Education Edition, we couldn't do that because he's on his school domain and I'm on my school domain, which means how your Office 365, you know, like is set up like only people that use, you know, that are in my school district can play with other kids in my, my school district. And the same applies for like Simon. So um, that's I, I personally would love to figure out a way that or have the education team um, have a way for us to work with other classes because I think collaborating across classes is very valuable. But for now, that's not something you can do. Yeah, and I'll drop into the chat. There is um, there's a how to set up a multiplayer game guide that was very useful for me. I had to work through that to overcome some of the issues I was having before I was able to actually get my second grade uh, teacher and her class working together. Um, but as, as Steve said, it, it, you know, there it's not insurmountable, but you definitely have to kind of know a little bit about your kind of home network and, and get in that tweaked so that it allows yeah. that connection. And Simon, put that put that resource in the wakelet. Yes. Stephen Friend, we had uh, one person ask how, if you can explain how students export worlds yes. to those using shared devices. Can I show that as well? Um, I'm still sharing my screen, I believe, right? Yes, yes, so, we're good to go. Okay, so <laughs> I have ended up coming up with like this whole process at the end of my class every day where I go, where I teach this and then remind the kids every day. So basically, I'm in my world right now, but I have to first save and exit before I can export my world. So I'm going to save and exit out of this world. That's going to bring me back to my view my worlds and all this. When I click view my worlds, this was the world I was just working on. If I click on it, I have options. I can play, host, which is that multiplayer thing, or go to settings. I'm going to click on settings. And these were a lot of the settings that I started my game with, if you remember. But on this right side here, if I scroll all the way down, there's this button for export world. Now, when I click on that, I can, do you see my my Windows screen here as well? Because I'm not sure if you are because I was sharing my. Yeah, we, we okay. see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can call this whatever, but the extension here is .mc world. So here's, if you look, <laughs> I have a lot of these usually. Um, this is one of my students' projects. But um, I, so I'm going to just save this as, um, you know, uh, I uh, inspire world. MC world. Now I can save this. Now that's just now what they did, which was really nice with this, um, is that 
as far as you or I are concerned, that's one file with this MC World extension. I could now share that MC World file. Like, in other words, I have my kids always upload it to Google Drive because we're a Google school. If you're using OneDrive, OneDrive is fine. They could email it to themselves. They could put it on a flash drive. That MC World file, what I have my kids do is put it on Google Drive and then share it with their teammates. So when they go home, they can download and import that world. So at the end of class every day for my kids, I always end class by saying, save and quit, export, upload, share. That's like the that's like our, our closure every day. Save and quit, export, upload, share. Now, it doesn't end there though, because if I share it on Google Drive and Simon's my partner and he downloads it and then he works on it, now, he has a new version of it that's sitting on his computer that has whatever he changed to it. So he would then have to save and exit, um, export, upload, and share this new version. So you end up getting into teaching your kids a little bit about multiple versions, and and which is, you know, that's a, a thing. But, but you just have to get into a groove where your kids understand that part of it, that they have to be conscious about that. Because I've had kids, of course, go home, work on it for two hours, then come back the next day and they forgot to send it back to themselves. And now they say, I can't work today because I have all this work that I did at home, you know, that kind of thing. So those are things to consider, but you can do it. And exporting your worlds is, is not really that complicated. It's just almost like a save as. It would be great if Minecraft just decided to call it save as because we would have understood that. But think of it that way. I, know. I was just working with uh, the middle school enrichment teacher. He wanted to do uh, share out a world that involved teaching about logic gates with his students. He he didn't want to have them all working in, in the same world together, but he did want to have that experience of using Minecraft as part of a distance learning enrichment opportunity. Mm -hmm. So he we just did this exact thing you've just done, Steve. We created the world together, set it up just perfectly for a student to work in, exported it, and then he shared it out. Uh, with, or he will be sharing it out with his students uh, next week for them to work in. And they're going to use the camera tool to kind of take pictures. And on their iPad, they're also going to screen record some short videos uh, of, you know, how they of their learning experience with learning about logic gates in this in this world. So perfect. Sweet. Somebody said something. OK, so Rebecca, um, you said you've been trying to download it and you're seeing code connection for Minecraft. That's something from the Windows Store. Um, the best, my favorite way to download Education Edition is aka.ms slash download. I'm going to put that in the chat. Um, that takes you right to the download screen for Education Edition. I'm not sure if you were looking somewhere else. Hey, Steve, um, it's, it's Haynes, Rebecca. Um, quick question, yes, I did that. So I had went to some training years back with Minecraft. This is like the, they had the old version. <laughs> so okay. they said, you know what, download it, but then um, Minecraft actually updated it, so then right. I had to reinstall it. So um, I have a question for you. Is it possible I can share out my screen? Because I've been trying to do this the entire meeting. So I can sure. show you what oh. I'm doing. Mean, as long as it'll let you, it's fine with me. Let's see. Hey, guys, since we're right at time, if you could very quickly just take everybody to the educator center and have them redeem their code, and then anybody who needs to drop off, um, because we're at time, then they can drop off, and anybody who needs to stay on okay. can stay on and ask questions and share screens. I will and all that share. Kind of I'll share that uh, the uh, the PowerPoint backup, Steve. Just a second. Does that have our link at the end for the? Um, yes. They need okay. And, and maybe I just I just pasted it in the chat window again. Oh. The actual okay, got it. Well, I'm clicking on share, and uh, my computer's I think it's on strike right now. Here we go. Uh, inspire. Okay, there's the PowerPoint. Let me just bring it down to the slide we need. I think we need this one right here. Can you all see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, and the code, and it's also in the chat from Jennifer, from Jen. So okay. there, and that, I guess that T dash, whatever, that's the code they need to enter. Yes. Right. Okay, thank you for doing that. That's helpful. Okay, now, did you want to share your screen, Amanda? It's Rebecca. Yeah. Rebecca, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Yes. Um, so I click on share screen, but it says only meeting organizers and presenters can share. So I guess you have to change the capability or functionality of this. Oh. Yeah, Maybe that I'm not. That. Okay. 
Okay, well, then I'll just describe it. So um, how about this? I'm going to send you stuff like in the chat and I'll just do like screenshots of what I have because it's for whatever reason, it's not letting me uninstall it. Okay, now, okay. Cheryl, thank you, by the way. <laughs> I just made, um, Rebecca, I just made you a presenter so you should be able to share your screen now. Really, thank you. I appreciate that, Jennifer. Okay, so um, let me see the top window. Okay, so can you all see my screen? Uh, I think we'll be able to. Yep, I see okay. myself on your screen. Cool. So then what I do is I went over to here just to see my Minecraft because I know I had like an older version. Um, and then when I had went to code connection to uninstall it, this is from years back, then I get this, you know, window or dialog box and then it just has all my programs, but I don't see anything from code connect. It's down there. It's down there I under see, class. I notebook. see it there. Okay. All right. Yeah. So let me see. That's Let's it. Try to uninstall it again, and then to uninstall a program, select it from the list and click change. Or no, no, no. See up, up where it says organize up here. Then I think you just click uninstall. There. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Now the other thing, I mean, that shouldn't actually even be really conflicting. I don't think um, you should. Have you tried to run Education Edition since you? I moved? have. Let okay. me show you. Let me show sure. you, uh, Steve. And then I don't think it should conflict with me being able to show you. Well, you're still going to code connection. All right, yeah. So Let me go to Minecraft. There we go. Yep. And our school is Broward County, so we have the Microsoft 365. I'm actually signed into like my Microsoft account, and okay. then this is what I get. Hold on, maybe it'll fix it. So you're a Broward County person. Yes. Okay. I'm All right. So I'm a fan of Eric and everybody over there. Okay. Wait. Say that again. I can't hear you. I said I'm a big fan of Eric Lightner. Yes, I can. I can there. see. Yeah, he's fantastic. Okay. So it wasn't doing this before. Um, I tried to uninstall the code, whatever connect. So mm -hmm. let me just do this now. Let's see if it'll fix it. And then because it's uh, free right now, it should hopefully pick up a free license from Minecraft. Oh, they've, got, right. they've got licenses in Broward County. They've got nothing. Oh, over. okay. Nothing All right. right, perfect. A sign in required, signing into it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think Give it a second. Okay, welcome to the latest release of Minecraft. Okay, learn more. That's okay. There you go, you're in. Okay, and then how do I get to, like, let's say I have students because they've been asking me about it. Um, you're saying that uh, I can host it, so I can just go to, like, join a world, or where well, do no, I go? Be creating the world first if you want to, them to join you. So you'd go to new, and now you can create it, however, and just click host. But again, remember, depending on your you might have challenges with your router settings at home or whatever. It might work fine, um, but those are some of those are going to be beyond our ability to help you <laughs> if, right. if it um, becomes a challenge. Gotcha. One, of my, so one of my one of my issues, Steve. Actually, uh, all of our students' iPads go through our school filter even while they're at home. So I had to actually get my IP address um, kind of whitelisted. Oh gosh. <laughs> I know there were a few steps, but um, I worked with my IT guys at school. You know the 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 network guy and he really helped me plus there's i put the link in the wakelet for you know the the, the troubleshooting guide if you do have problems uh, okay and then how do we get to like i'm probably seeing the wrong terminology because this is years ago that i use this um is it we click on letter e for inventory to be able like to get to the little blocks and stuff yeah we we okay. joke and say that it's like you would think it would be i for inventory we call it the everything tory Okay, got you. All right. And then how do I actually get to because I see it took me to Minecraft, but I don't see where it says like, you know, hey, guys, here's the code that I want you like to join my world. Hit escape. Okay. Now oh. there's the join code. Got you. Okay, cool. And then yep. the kids would just um, put this in here into mm -hmm. theirs into their join world part. Yep. Okay, cool. And then I remember a couple years back, I don't know if this is still relevant. The code connect, I'm pretty sure, was for like IP addresses. So you could, yeah, like, don't, I, um, you don't need that anymore. Right. And this IP address that you have right there, 
if you were to give that to kids to join to, that wouldn't work because that's your home local IP address. So like somebody in your house might be able to join to that, but for what you're doing, you would need to use the code with the pictures. Um, but no, for code connection, don't worry about that connect thing anymore. In fact, quit out of this, go to resume game. Okay, so I'm gonna click out. No, don't click do that. Out of this. No, 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 no. Go to resume no, no. game to the- uh, It's on the, that tab, yes. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, no, 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 see up top where it says no. resume game. Just click that little left arrow. Oh, resume game, there we go. The little left arrow next to it, yeah. Now just hit C, hit C on your keyboard. And that brings up code builder. Oh, wow, they have one in Tinker. Okay, so this yep. is what you guys were saying. All right, cool, Microsoft make code and then Tinker. Oh, wow, yeah. cool. Um, and then my last question is this. I don't know if it's different for every district. The classroom mode, we would have to download that as something separate. And does that, that work is, for? It, that is and it works separate? during. It, yeah, it's still separate. Uh, and, it, and it's worked really well with remote learning. And while even though the kids are all in different locations, I was still able to do all of those uh, classroom connect options, uh, pausing the game, moving them around. Um, so that was a separate download, right, from the from the download page on the on the website. OK, got you. All right, so I don't think I have any questions. That was just my main thing was downloading it. I think Code Connect was definitely causing the problem. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Sure. And sure, um, welcome. any other questions while we're at it? Um, are you guys having another training just specifically on Minecraft? Um, not right now. I have a I have a course in the works um, with participate.com. That's going to be a that's going to start in about a week. That's going to be, I think, about a six to 10 hour course in Minecraft Education Edition. That will be a combination of online like live sessions that will then be recorded, but also, um, you know, sort of an asynchronous portion of the course. So if you're on participate.com and look for their game based learning community, um, it's going to be happening through there. OK, so participate.com and then you said game based learning. Yeah, and I think it's just participate it might be .com slash game based learning. That could be wrong. Um, and then also, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll always know what I'm up to because I, I share it, <laughs> you know, regularly. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I've been helping a lot of people through Twitter recently with with, you know, being able to connect with their students and and, and all sorts of things. So yeah, reach out to any of us on Twitter. We'll be happy to help. Okay, is it possible? I'm sorry. Can you drop the link in there? Because I'm on participate, but it's saying um, something like um, plus on education. I don't know if that's the right one exactly. Um, yeah, Thanks, uh, let me try to find it. Please drop the link in the chat window. I wonder if that's right, though. Let me just check. Nope. Um, gosh darn it. It always does this to me. Let me yeah, let me log in and I'll um, I'll find you the right link. And then I'll drop it in the chat. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we're we're at time, you guys. We want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, thank you for staying on. Um, you know, feel free to connect with these guys through um, any online resources, um, Twitter, um, any social media. But we appreciate you joining us today. And um, we should be sending out a follow up email after this conference. Um, so thank you, and keep an eye out for that. Have a great day. Yeah. And Rebecca, send me a note through either Twitter or email or something, and I'll get you that link. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Good job. Thanks, you too. Thanks.